Thank you. Uh, I haven't. I'm a little confused about my preparation because my mind is still in the previous wonderful lecture about physics. So if I mix up manifolds and physics, you have to forgive me. Uh, I'm also giving this lecture on somewhat false pretenses because this seminar is called Basic Notions and one is supposed to tell some basic notion that all mathematicians or all physicists or all everybody should know and, but that is kind of very well known to some experts but actually what I'll do is different. I will talk about something very basic that everyone should know but everyone does know what the question that I'll talk about means and what I want to explain is that rather surprisingly the answer is not as stupid as the question sounds. So there seems to be no chalk at all that's more than an eighth of an inch long. There are hundreds of very small pieces but I'll do my best. So I should say by the way right at the beginning before I forget that this is joint work with Matthias Kreck in Bonn but actually it's his question and he told me about a year ago we were waiting for a train I was accompanying him to the station to the platform and the train was late so we had 15 minutes and I said you're a topologist we're old friends tell me something you do that might involve number theory so he told me that 25 years ago he invented this question what are the Betty numbers of a manifold And he assumed that it was very well known, but he looked in the literature, maybe in that day not yet Google, but now he's tried Google and Wikipedia, and there was nothing really known about it. And then he told many colleagues, what a nice question. Everybody was completely bored and said, what a stupid question. Why are you wasting our time? So he dropped it for many years. And then a few years ago, one or two people did get interested. One is a topologist called Jim Davis, who gave it as a thesis problem, a very special case to a student who solved it partially. There's a lot of overlap between her results and ours. She's called Sue. Maybe I'll write it later. But I just want to say that this question has been around for a couple of decades, but somehow nobody could see what the point was. So I want to tell you that there is some point and that it's actually quite an amusing story. So first I start as if this were an honest basic numbers seminar and I'll first answer the question, what are the Betty numbers of a manifold? Meaning, what is the definition? But then I'll come to the theme of the talk, which is what are the Betty numbers of a manifold? Meaning, what is the answer? It's very different to define the question and to give the answer. So this title is intentionally a little provocative. It sounds like everybody knows what that is, but what everybody knows is the definition of the question, not necessarily the answer. So first of all, what is a manifold? Well, a manifold has a dimension n, which I hope I'll remember to always call n and not keep changing, n-dimensional manifold. And in this talk, all manifolds will be smooth, compact, so no boundaries. So smooth means C-infinity. Compact, so no boundary. And also connected. Because if you have a non-connected manifold, like for instance uh, two spheres, it might be good for physics, but in mathematics, at least for the topology, it's not very interesting. You just add the Betty numbers and there's nothing really to be said. Now, here this smooth, you might think, well, what's the difference? Smooth, topological, PL, some kind of manifold. It turns out to make a big difference. And if I asked it this in the topological category, then the answer would be, we don't know at all. It's much harder. Okay, so what is first, I remind you what a smooth manifold is. You start with Euclidean n space, which is just the n-fold product of R with itself, and you have a topological space such that locally every point has a little neighborhood which you have identified in a specific way with a little neighborhood of a point in Rn. But it's not that specific. You give yourself some freedom. You can have many such local charts, and the requirement of smoothness is that you've done it in such a way that if you take two different ways of identifying your little piece of your smooth manifold with a little piece of Euclidean space, if you take two different ways of doing that, then on the overlap of those 
uh, regions, if there is one, the passage, or, or let's say I've done it in different Euclidean spaces, but the identification of a little bit of one Rn with a little bit of the other is smooth in the usual sense. It's given by an n-tuple of C infinity functions. But I mean, I'm not going to give a mini course in topology. I actually assume that everyone knows what the manifold is. It's something that looks like Euclidean space uh, locally. Of course, it may not be oriented because it looks like Euclidean space locally, but when you go around the path, you may come back and find your Euclidean space is turned on its head. A typical example would be the Mobius strip, but the Mobius strip wouldn't do this because it's got a boundary. It's a strip with, with a twist, so that's not a manifold with, with no boundary. But, for instance, the famous... I'm going to have to move this so it doesn't keep crashing with my hand. Uh, if you take the Klein bottle, that would be an example. So if n equals zero, there's only one example because it's connected, it's a point. If n equals one, there's also only one example. It's the circle. Now the circle is orientable, and then you could say you could give two different orientations. So in this case, they're isomorphic. But I won't worry about orienting my manifolds, but I will distinguish orientable and non-orientable in a moment. For n equals two, so this is orientable. And here's non-orientable. Well, there aren't any non-orientable zero or, for that matter, one manifolds. So that's the classification here. Here you have, of course, the Riemann sphere, or there's simply the sphere, the two-sphere. Then you have the torus. Then you have the double torus. And so on, you have the surface with G holes. So with G as G, where G is zero for the sphere, one for the torus, two for the double torus, etc. So you can, and that's the complete classification that's been known for, I don't know, 150 years at least. And in the non-symmetric world, you start with RP2, which is S2 divided by identifying antipodal points. Then you have the Klein model. I can't draw anything non-orientable. Actually, I can't even draw anything orientable. But you somehow make a bottle, and then the end of the bottle is thirsty and goes inside the bottle and joins up with the bottom. And in doing that, it flips around. Anyway, I'm sure you've all seen pictures of the Klein bottle. And here, too, you can go on. So this one is no handles, one handles. You have, again, a kind of a genus, sometimes also called G, which can take on the value 0, 1, 2, and so on. In dimension 3, there's already a great deal of choice, and you get million-dollar prizes for proving things. But one thing you also ha always have in every dimension is the n-sphere which is, well, I think everybody has seen the n-sphere. It's the, either the vectors of length 1 in Euclidean n plus 1 space, or topologically you can take an n-dimensional uh, plane and add one point at infinity and kind of fold it together in a way that I think everybody has seen the pictures. So those are what the manifolds are, both orientable and non-orientable. And then to each manifold, m, and n means it's an n-manifold, we associate the Betty numbers. So Bi is the ith Betty number, and the formal definition, I'll mostly work over Q, uh, so it's the ith homology of M with coefficients in Q, but it's also the dimension of the ith cohomology of M with coefficients in Q. At least in the orientable case, uh, I guess always, these things are, those two spaces are dual, so they have the same dimension. If I worked with coefficient zz, they wouldn't be quite dual, but anyway, I want the dimension, or if you worked over z, the rank. But intuitively, and again, I think everybody has seen this and knows it very well, bi is the number of linearly independent. So this means over z, and therefore also over q. Because if you had something, say, that's torsion, then, well, three times it would be zero, that would be a linear relation. So when I say linearly independent over z, it's really over q. It's the uh, number of i-dimensional, and if you're very careful, <coughs> orientable cycles. And I won't try here, because I mean, that would be a basic notion seminar, but I think too elementary, to explain exactly the definition of singular homology and singular cohomology, you can think of I, uh, of Bi of these cycles as being represented by I-dimensional submanifolds. And if the I-dimensional submanifold happens to be the boundary of something I plus one dimensional, it's zero. That's correct as far as it goes. An embedded I-dimensional manifold does have a homology class. And if it's the boundary of an I plus one dimensional 
embedded manifolded boundary is zero homology, but not every homology class can be represented that way. And even if it can, it may be zero in homology even if it doesn't balance something smooth. So that's why you need what's called singular, meaning not necessarily smooth homology. And it's done carefully and actually fairly tediously in every course of beginning algebraic topology. And I won't do it. But you can believe me certainly that there's a definition. So from this definition, one sees immediately that bi is zero if i is bigger than n because there's no room for an for an i plus uh, more than n-dimensional cycle in something n-dimensional, we also see that b0 is 1 because it's connected. So if you have your manifold, uh, then you can represent a zero-dimensional cycle as a point, and any zero-dimensional cycle is just a number of points, maybe taken positively or negatively, so the group is z, but you can move any point to any other point because it's connected, so the group is just z. So the dimension is 1. And finally, Bn, the last one, is 1 if it's oriented. Because the only n-dimensional thing you have room for in an n-dimensional manifold is the manifold itself. Or maybe twice the manifold, or three times, or minus three times. But since it's oriented cycles, you only get that if it's, if it's an oriented manifold. So the top betting number you know, it's if not. So we already have a tiny little bit of uh, information. And so the actual question is, more precisely, given some numbers b0 up to bn, I don't have to specify more, since we know that the higher ones are 0, and actually I can start writing some of the conditions, this has to be 1 and so on, uh, is there an n-manifold realizing these numbers, in other words, having exactly these Betty numbers. Okay, so that's the question, and it still sounds certainly very innocuous. Certainly, I've, uh, so far, I've only said very, very standard and easy things that everybody has seen in any kind of a course on topology. So, let me first write down some sufficient conditions. Well, there are two basic ones, and they both come from the Euler characteristic, which is the simplest uh, invariant of a manifold. So the Euler characteristic chi of the manifold is known to be the alternating sum of Sj if you triangulate the manifold. So, for instance, I have my two manifold, and I triangulate. It doesn't have to be triangles. It could be something else. It doesn't really matter, so I divide it up into little polytopes uh, in some way, and then Sj, well, let's say, I okay, I could actually do it that way. Sj is the number of j-dimensional simplices. Maybe I do want to triangulate then for this. But that's uh, the elementary definition, but not very useful because it's quite hard to see. That's what Euler proved for the two-sphere, but you have to do it for every manifold. Uh, a manifold has lots of different ways of triangulating and there's no visible reason why uh, this is always the same since these numbers sj depend on how you triangulate, of some triangulation. Triangulation means you've divided up into polytopes. So this is sort of the bad definition and the way that one know that this is an invariant, you show that that's the same as the sum minus 1 to the i bi and bi are the Betty numbers and these are individually invariants each one, whereas the SJ are not individually invariants, only their alternating sum. So the Euler characteristic, which is the oldest topological invariant by uh, 150 years or something since Euler discovered it, that's an invariant that you define in terms of non-invariant things and you have to work, and then this formula writes it as a, weak, uh, a weakening of giving the entire uh, information about all the Betty numbers. So now the, the, that's one important f fact. The second important fact is Poincaré duality, and the third, the most important for this lecture, I'll come to a bit later, that'll be the Hertzberg signature theorem. But Poincaré duality tells you that if, if M is oriented, then you can intersect an I-dimensional cycle and an N-dimensional cycle, and you get an integer, which is the number of intersection points, even physically if you move them around so that they intersect nicely and transversely, and that intersection number is a pairing 
So it tells you that Hi and Hn minus I have a non-degenerate pairing into Q. These are vector spaces over Q. This is non-degenerate. And so that identifies Hi with Hn minus I, and that implies that Bi is equal to Bn minus I in the oriented case, and therefore this sequence of numbers is symmetric. But it implies one more thing, which is also very easy but not quite obvious. Can anybody tell me what else follows about just about the Betty numbers from Poincaré duality? Come on, come on. Let me give an example, question, a mini question. Is there an oriented, I'm doing oriented here, an oriented two-manifold called a surface with Betty numbers, maybe from now on when, it, when it's convenient, I'll just write the vector of Betty numbers. I don't have to keep writing B0 equals B1 equals B2 equals. So I want 1, 1, 1. Is there such a manifold? No, certainly not. If you look at the little table that I raised, we had you know, zero holes, one hole, two holes, but the middle Betty number was twice the number of holes. A torus has two cycles, one that way and one that way. In fact, the answer is no. And so the other condition is that if n is congruent to 2 mod 4, which means it's twice an odd number, then the middle Betty number is even. So if n is odd, there is no Betty, middle Betty number. The numbers are just symmetric. But if n is even, there's a middle Betty number. It can be even, it can be odd. But it can only be odd if n itself is a multiple of 4. And the reason is very simple. If n over 2, if n is 2 mod 4, then n over 2 is an odd number. But the, this is the, if I think in cohomology, which again, everybody has seen, then this is the cup product. It goes into Hn, which is canonical as morph into Q. And uh, that's a skewed symmetric pairing because it's an odd dimension and cohomology class with odd dimensions and they commute with each other. And a skewed symmetric non-degenerate pairing that's called a symplectic structure on a manifold can only exist if the dimension of the vector space is even. And that's why in the two-dimensional case, but also in the six or 10 or 14-dimensional case, the middle Betty number has to be even. Now, how about the non-orientable case? So we already have B0 equals Bn equals 1. So we know it starts with 1, it ends with 1. There's something in the middle, but the something in the middle is at least symmetric and even in the middle if n is 2 times an odd number. Now, what if n is non-oriented? So these are sort of the trivial conditions. So I called it 0. Well, here I already told you the 0th condition is still connected, so B0 is 1. It's now not oriented, so B1 is 1. This condition, the one that you all would have thought of that it's symmetric, is missing because it's not oriented. There's no duality between i and n minus i. But there is a condition 1, which is not quite obvious. Can somebody guess or tell me what the condition is? For instance, is there a non-oriented threefold, well, any threefold, but it'll have to be non-orientable, with Betty numbers 1, 3, 5, 0. So it's a threefold, so it has to start with 1 and end in 0 if it's non-oriented. Can that happen? Can I have 1, 3, 5, 0? Answer, no. Namely, the second condition is that if n is odd, then the alternating sum of the Betty numbers has to be 0. And here, 1 minus 3 plus 5 is not 0. Why is that? Well, you see, in the oriented case, I don't have to write that as an extra condition, but here you immediately see if n is odd, then chi is the sum, by definition, minus 1 to the i, b, i. But by Frank Ray duality, that's minus 1 to the i, b, n minus i which if I rephrase sending i to n minus i is the sum minus 1 to the n minus i bi. So it's minus 1 to the n times chi. And so in the orientable case, you see immediately that if the dimension of the manifold is odd, like a 3-manifold three, three or 5-manifold, then the Euler characteristic is always odd simply because the Betty numbers come in pairs, and they cancel. So I didn't have to write that as an extra condition. It's a consequence of 1. Here, it does not follow from, from that one because that one isn't true. But it's still true, and the reason is very simple. I told you that the Euler characteristic is more elementary as an invariant 
than the Betty numbers, but it's also much more robust. You can do anything to topology, and you never harm the Euler characteristic. It's, it's invincible. You can mess up you know, Betty numbers, blow, you do all kinds of things. But Betty numbers, like in fibrates, with things uh, degenerate and so on, the Euler characteristic survives all bad treatments. So one of the bad treatments you can do is you can say, let me not work over Q, let me work over Z or Z, and now let me reduce mod 2. Now I'm back to coefficients, this is slightly technical, but just for a second, in Z modular 2, which is a field. And over Z modular 2, unlike Z modular P for any odd prime P, your manifold is oriented, because if you go around the path and come back, you flip the orientation, so something has gone to minus itself, but in characteristic 2, minus X equals X. So your manifold becomes oriented, and suddenly, Poincaré duality, which is false over Q, false over Z, and false over Z mod P for P odd, it's true in characteristic Z2. And therefore, the, the new Betty numbers, which are the dimensions of the Z2 cohomology, as vector spaces over that lousy little field of two elements, but still they're finite dimensions, they now satisfy Poincaré duality. Their alternating sum seems to have nothing to do with the original one because that was the sum of integers, which are much smaller in general. But no, it's the same. That's the robustness. The Euler characteristic is independent of the field you calculated in. So because the Euler characteristic over Q is the same as over Z, which is the same as over Z2, where it is oriented, there you have Poincaré duality, and the results that this is true. So therefore, if we look up to dimension 4, here are the possibilities. So, possibilities, possible B, vectors B, which is B0 to Bn, for N less than or equal to 4. So, I should define the word low-dimensional topology. For most topologists, low-dimensional topology means up to N equals 4. That's because around the time I was a graduate student, Smale uh, and other people proved the h cobordism theorem, the hope from Wood, and every big conjecture of topology in dimensions bigger than or equal to 5. And so topologists feel it's small if it's 4 or less. So that's why I took that. But for this talk, I'm a number theorist. I don't play around with things like 4. Small for me means less than or equal to 1 million. So this will be a lecture about low dimensional topology, but in this somewhat extended sense. But for the moment, n only goes up to 4. So here's n. And here's the orientable case. And here's the non-orientable case. Well, I already told them dimension one, the only possibility is the point, and here there's nothing. Here the only possibility is the circle, the betting numbers are one and one. Indeed, the order characteristic is zero, as it should be in all dimensions, and it's nice and symmetric. Here there's nothing. Here I already told you, you have a number 2G, but I'll call it 2A, where here A and in a second B, C are simply non-zero integers. So it has to have the form one, something one, by the symmetry, and the a is greater than or equal to zero, and two a has to be an even number. And here, uh, it could be one, anything, but it can't be zero. So I'll call it a plus one, and then it's zero, because it's non-orientable. Okay, so a equals zero would be the RP2, a equals one would be the Klein bottle. Then here, again by symmetry, you have 1 a a 1. Now there's no restriction on a. The alternating sum is automatically 0. And here, it's 1 a plus 1 a and 0. Because the order characteristic has to be 0. This number is 0. That one's 1. And this, the alternating sum is 0. So it has to be 1 a plus 1 a and 0. And finally here, a priori, you might have 1 a b a. One, there's no restriction that B is even because four is not twice an odd number, it's twice an even number. And here you could have one A, B, C, zero, and there's no restriction at all because uh, the order characteristic doesn't have to be zero because it's odd dimensional. So up, what I've told you up to now says these are the only possibilities, and up to here we've solved the problem, they all occur. In fact, I can state immediately the following theorem, but as far as we know, it's new. So in the joint paper, which is half written up, it's written, I mean, Matthias proved it. It's written as a new theorem. It seems not to be in the literature. Theorem, in the non-orientable case, well, the theorem I could just write in three letters, if and only if. In other words, B occurs if and only the conditions that I told you are uh, all satisfied, so they're all non-negative. B n is zero. The first one is zero, and chi is zero if n is odd. That's
that's not to complete the trivial theorem. You use some surgery, so there is some topology going into it, but it's relatively elementary. And anyway, the, the result is kind of disappointing. Uh, the necessary, the obviously necessary conditions are sufficient, so you don't get any surprising new conditions. Now, let me show you why these things occur. Uh, before I show you that, let me make a preliminary thing. So this is, actually, I said there are four basic things I'll use. Euler characteristic, Planck ray duality, and the Hertzberg signature theorem. But there's one other, which is very easy, so I'll put it now. And that's what's called connected sum. And then, as I say, I'll come still to the Hertzberg signature theorem uh, a little later, and that's the thing that makes it work. It makes it interesting, makes it non-trivial. So first here, I'll first just draw a picture. Let's say I have an n-manifold. M1 and another N manifold with the same uh, N. So here, for instance, both of them are two manifolds because I can't really draw anything else. And then what you do if you're, well, what physicists, actually topologists usually do is they make a little hole here and make a little hole here and connect them by a tube. But actually it's easier, but I can't move on the board, to make a little hole here and then not make a little tube just move them together and glue them along the boundary. So you cut out uh, a little uh, neighborhood of a point, which by definition is an n-dimensional disk, because locally near any point these things look like n-space, and then those two disks are the same, actually you have to do it in orientable reversing ways, so you can cancel the two, and you just glue together, and it's very easy to see that if you do this with another initial point, you get exactly the same thing. This is a well-defined operation on the types, and when you do that, then let me call it M and M prime, uh, double prime. So M is, it's actually called the connected sum. And then BI is simply the sum of the Betty numbers, except that, of course, B0, sorry, uh, B0 is 1, and which is equal to B0 prime, which is equal to B0 double prime. So because it's the connected sum, you've taken out that point in a little neighborhood. So you took out two points and put together just one, or one little disk, and that's why the zeroth Betty number is not added. Of course, it can't because it has to be one, but all the others just add. So if you think about it now, if I take SJ, I didn't say that, but the smallest thing you might have is the n-sphere. And the n-sphere is orientable for every n, and it is, of course, it's, it's your clicking space plus one point. So if you remove that point, and therefore if you have any cycle of dimension less than n, it can't hit every point, let's say it doesn't hit infinity, then it's sitting in Euclidean space, which is contractible. So there's no homology in intermediate dimensions. So you get 1, 0, 0, 1. But now if I take SK and SN minus K, then I have to multiply 1, so it's easier to do with generating functions, so I multiply 1 plus X to the K times 1 plus X to the N minus K, then I get 1 plus X to the K plus X to the N minus K, plus x to the n, so assuming for the sake of argument that k is the smaller of these two numbers, I'll have uh, a zero in position, a uh, one in position one, k, n minus k, and n, and so I'll get a new manifold where I've added one to, uh, to those two positions, but now more generally, if m had any b0, bk, uh, bn minus k, and bn, then if I take the connected sum of M with this product, as I told you, I just add, sorry, this was also uh, BN, of course, by Poincaré duality, because you've taken out an N disk. So except for the top and bottom, they're just one, but all the intermediate ones you just add. So now I've, I've got a one in two symmetric positions, and now I've just added one to those two numbers. And of course, in the case when K equals N minus K, that can only occur if N is even, then I'll have b0, bn over 2, and I've added 2 to it. Because, of course, the product of the n over 2 sphere with itself has Betty numbers 1, 0, 0, 2 in the middle, 0, 0, 0, 1. So I can always go up. So now you immediately see. So we can, we can send m to m connected sum with sk across sn minus k, and this will send bi goes to bi plus 1, if i is equal to k or n minus k, this is if k, let's say, is smaller than n over 2, and otherwise the same, bi else. And in the case when, as I already said, if k is equal to n over 2, 
then you send the middle uh, daily number up by two, and you don't change it otherwise. So if we didn't have the two, if we just had a one, my problem would be rather trivial because I start with the sphere, and I can add even I can add two ones in complementary position. Then I can make that number have any value a and the same value a by Poincaré duality have to have the same value. So I can get everything, but in the middle I can only add even numbers. Now if n is an odd number, there is no middle. I, that doesn't bother me. And if n is two times an odd number, so two mod four, it also doesn't bother me because I know that the middle betty number has to be even anyway. It's on the list. So something now an easy fact is in the orientable case, which we've done the non-orientable case, one the Betty, the Euler, the, the obvious conditions, so the Poincaré duality conditions, obvious conditions are sufficient except if n is 0 mod 4 and the specified Betty number, remember I've given you some Betty numbers that I'm asking for, is odd. So if n is not a multiple of 4, you can always do it, and if n is a multiple of 4, but the numbers I offered you, the middle one is even, the others come in pairs, then just by taking the sphere and adding a connected sum of products of spheres, you can realize anything. So the only interesting case is the case when n is 4k, and I want, well, I'm not saying we, the others are trivial, but in the middle dimension, which is 2k, well, sorry, these are just the dimensions, but the Betty numbers that you've specified are one, some odd number, and one. And then here you've put something that you like. Then this case is not at all trivial, it turns out. So at least now we've produced what sounded like a somewhat structuralist problem to a very, very specific one. The dimension of the manifold is a multiple of four. And we also, so another fact, uh, so the other fact is if there exists, and now I'll call the letters RPP, so let me define that. Definition, a rational projective plane. of dimension n is an n-manifold. n will have to be even. In fact, it will have to be a multiple of 4, as you'll see in a minute, with many numbers b0 equals bn over 2 equals bn equals 1 and else 0. So by what I've already told you, that can only happen if it's oriental because this is a 1. It can only happen if n is a multiple of 4 because otherwise the middle number had to be even. And so n will certainly have to be a multiple of 4. Why do we call it a projective plane? So this, remember, these are the rational cohomology. So it means that the dimension of h of the manifold with coefficients in q, so it's over, over q, it's 1 if i is 0, n over 2, or n, and it's 0 else. Why do we call it a rational projective plane? Well, you have rp2 that I already mentioned. That's non-orientable. But the Euler characteristics over z2 are, in that case, 1, 1, 1. So it's exactly like this, except now n is an odd number. Uh, I mean, it's 1, 1, 1. But if we take only oriental manifolds, you have the complex projective plane, which is extremely important in algebraic geometry. It's the simplest surface, the rational uh, surface, or P2 of C, whatever you like to call it. Uh, and P2 of C is Betty numbers 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So it's four-dimensional. And similarly, this is the complex projective plane. But then, as well as the complex numbers, you have the quaternions. And so you have P, uh, P2 of the quaternions, or QP2, it's sometimes called, quaternionic one. And that is Betty numbers 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So here N is 8. And there's one more because we also have the Cayley numbers, which are not even, this is associative but not commutative. The Cayley numbers is nothing, but it's still an eight dimensional uh, thing. A division algebra of some sort. So you have it also is a projective plane. And then that one is one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, a whole bunch of zeros and a one. So if n is four, eight, or sixteen, they're actual projective planes, which are specific manifolds associated to specific vector spaces of dimension two, four uh, of uh, well, complex dimension, no, real dimension. 
4, 8, or 16. You've divided. Anyway, they're what they are. Uh, and these are called projective planes, and so these are called rational projective planes. So in particular, if n is 4 or 8, we can realize the middle number with the simplest possible number, which is 1 or 1 in the middle. Since we can also realize a 0 in the middle with the sphere, if there's a rational projective plane of dimension n, so that's this RPP, if it exists, then we have both the sphere with many numbers 0 in the middle, one, of course, at the ends and otherwise zero, or the projective plane with the one in the middle. And now by connected sums with spheres, we can raise the other numbers by one at a time symmetrically, and the middle one by two at a time, but starting at zero or one, so we can produce everything. So therefore, I've now solved my problem. That's why this table was complete for n equals four, and also for n equals eight, and also for n equals 16. So if n is not zero modulo four, then the problem is solved. It's always solved, as I told you, the unorientable case. It's simply always true if the necessary conditions are satisfied. And in the orientable case, there's only a problem if n is 0 mod 4. And if n happens to be 8, 16, or 32, sorry, 4, 8, or 16, then the problem is also solved. So now we're still left with infinitely many numbers, which are the multiples of n, which are not 4, 8, or 16. So let me tell you first the answer, and then explain a little where it's coming from. So a question. Question, what about other n, with, right by what I said, we can assume now it's 4k. Well, the answer is very short. I can tell you one sentence. We don't know. Nobody's a clue. In fact, I can strengthen that statement. I'm willing to bet anything, but we can't settle the bet, so it's worthless, that we will never know. Humanity will never know if the theorem that I'm going to tell, which has kind of a conjecture in it, we will never really know. Okay? And that's an unusual statement, because after all, somebody might be you know, cleverer than we are. It's happened before, and it'll probably happen again. So how do I, well, not how do I know, but why do I even think that? So let me tell you the answer to the extent that I do know it. So here's a theorem. Well, there's one little theorem that I can tell you. Theorem, if n is 4k, and if it's not 8, we already saw, or I already told you without really giving any details that n, sorry, if it's not 4, I mean, then I don't need any details. Then you have CP2, and since it's a multiple of 4 bigger than 4, then there is no rational projective plane. That's very easy, and it's a special case of things I'll tell you later. So actually, you can eliminate the odd multiples of 4 right away, except for 4 itself. So in particular, we already had, we've done it for all non-multiples of 4, so the only interesting numbers so far were 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, and 24. 4, 8, and 16 occur, and now I've told you that 12 and 20 don't, and so the first question mark is already dimension 24, which is a very nice dimension. You know, 24 we saw in the previous talk, and whenever you see 24, it's always related to zeta of 2 and zeta of minus 1, except today, it's just the first one on the list, which where the problem is not trivial. Okay, so that's the first point. We, so actually, from now on, I won't even call n is 4k. I'll call it 8k, so it's not the same k. I apologize. But anyway, now I want. So theorem. Here's a nice theorem. So this is Crack and myself, but, uh, but there were previous things proving much the same sort of thing with a weaker, a weaker number theoretical conclusion by Sue and two co-workers whose names suddenly escape me and I don't have... So this was Sue in her thesis, Kennard, and another one with, I think, Fowler. So I'll also put Kennard, and maybe there's also a paper with her supervisor, with Jim Davis, so I don't want to be too careful about this. None of these are terribly deep theorems. Anyway, once you've seen how it works and what tools to use, it's straightforward application of known theorems. But the fun part is that the answer is, is non-trivial. So here's the theorem. Well, you'll say, what do you mean theorem? You just told us you don't know, and now you're telling. So I don't know exactly, but I know the following. So first of all, the first statement is there exists an n-dimensional Rational projective plane 
for the values? Well, I already told you 4, 8, and 16. 24, in fact, does not occur. That Sue already showed in her thesis. 32 does. She also showed that. Strangely enough, 64 doesn't, but 128 and 256 both occur. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that gives you six examples. And for no other n less, actually less than or equal, but let's not quibble, less than a million. So I told the low dimensional topology for me today is n less than or equal to a million. Uh, no other. Except possibly And now comes the list of exceptions. 544 5, is the first possible exception. The next one is 4,160. Then 8224. I hope you see the pattern. If you do, you're a better man or woman than we are, because we certainly don't, and I don't think there is a pattern. Well, actually, the pattern, these are the numbers we haven't yet succeeded with our computer. In solving, and every so often, after weeks go by, suddenly the computer announces that it's cracked another one, and then one of these is removed from the list. So the original list was longer. I don't know if you really want the whole list. Maybe I'll leave out a couple. I'm sure you all believe that I can copy numbers from a piece of paper. So there are 19 uh, unsolved cases. Uh, up to a million, but infinitely many unsolved cases up to infinity namely practically everything that we haven't yet got. I'll explain where this comes from. Uh, excuse me, thank you very much. <laughs> K odd. Yeah, I even said it. I said it's the odd multiples we won't get. We can restrict to 8K, but I forgot to write. Thank you very much, yeah. Otherwise, the, the thing would be dead as a doornail to say nothing of being completely false, that all of these exams would contradict that. Theorem. So you don't get any odd multiples of 4 except 4 itself, so it's, it has to be a multiple of 8. That's so easy, I won't even go into the proof with the things I'm saying that comes out immediately. So the first exceptional case is 544, which is 8 times, so you really have to write n is 8k. And I find it very surprising that as small as a number is 68, using big computers we let, we're doing this with the help of our computer expert in Bonn, he's running it in parallel, very, very fast mainframes in Munich in the Max Planck Society, not even in our institute. They ran for three months using the most sophisticated algorithms, and uh, it's, you know, many of them died. They hit the, bit the dust, but 68, which is a pretty small number, is still unsolved. Now, when I said I think humanity will never know the answer, I'm perfectly willing to bet that humanity will know the answer even in the next five years, maybe, but if not in the next 5,000 years, depends a little on computer progress, for 68. So we will eventually know whether 544 occurs or not. But the problem you have to solve, I can already reveal something, it's one about primality, testing whether certain numbers, which are certainly not prime, they have no reason to be, they have lots of prime factors, if their prime factors have a certain property, which they almost certainly have if you get big enough. So I can give, give a guess. The number of rational projective planes is probably, almost certainly I'd say, very probably, exactly six. Maybe seven, but it would surprise me. That would be if this 544 succeeds, and almost for sure, uh, less than or equal to eight. I mean, I have no specific reason except analyzing the probabilities. If you work out the total number of probability that any of these 19 exceptions, or any of the infinitely many numbers bigger than a million that we haven't yet tested, that any of them fail the test that were the very stringent test, or rather pass the very stringent test that they have to pass, it's extremely unlikely, and it becomes extremely much more unlikely as the number grows. So if there isn't a further counterexample on this list, there's almost certainly none beyond that. And already this one, it's very unlikely that it'll succeed, but it has a small chance that any of the others do is extremely unlikely. So I would say probably there are exactly these six, maybe this one as well, and conceivably one more, almost certainly on that short list, but it's going to stop. But there's no way to prove that. And you'll see when I say the number theory, that, you know, the actual number theoretical statement, that then leads to something you check on the computer and this is the answer, that's something that we have no reason to think can be solved. You're essentially asking about something that has a quite random behavior. If I say I can prove some property of manifolds if the nth digit of 
pi is a 7. Uh, and then, you know, it's very unlikely that we'll ever be able to prove that there are infinitely many 7s in the expansion of pi. Maybe you can, because that's, you know, proof that it's well distributed. But if you're something even more esoteric, something completely random, like the, like for instance, for between the nth and the 2 nth digits of pi, the digits are equidistributed. Well, that's surely true, but, you know, there's no particular... Or take something very unlikely. Let's say you want some huge collection of digits of pi with no 7s at all. Then you could say after a while, that's very unlikely to ever happen. If, if the sequence gets longer and longer, say the sequence from n to n, n squared to n plus 1 squared. It's extremely unlikely that those are all sevens, but it's also, I think, very unlikely that that's a provable theorem, not because humanity is too dumb, but because it's not a theorem. It's just a random experimental fact. It may be true, but not all three statements have to have a proof, and there's absolutely no reason to think that there's any proof, meaning a finite sequence of arguments that, that shows that it's always true. And here I think it's the same. So this very uh, harmless sounding problem led, first of all, to quite surprisingly hard results, including that there are several tricky cases, uh, but, uh, but not to a complete answer. So another theorem, maybe I won't write it down, but I said that the full question is not just, is there a rational projective plane? Remember that I said, if there's a rational projective plane in dimension n, then you get everything. Because you have one all zeros and a zero in the middle, and you have one all zeros and a one in the middle. But if there isn't a rational projective plane, which is almost always the case, presumably for every n except those eight, then the only hard case I explained is one and an odd number in the middle. Then we can give a complete answer when you can have just an odd number in the middle. But then we don't know that the other numbers are zero. Maybe you achieve that number with other numbers. So we don't know. But there is a theorem. So theorem, uh, the problem is decidable. If a specific algorithm, we've done many cases. For any fixed vector B of many numbers. So a fixed vector is a fixed length. So if you give me a potential thing like 1, 3, 2, 5, 2, 3, 1, which satisfies the duality, and to make it interesting, is odd in the middle, then in a finite amount of time, I can tell you if there's a manifold with the appropriate dimension with those Betty numbers. It's, that's algorithmic, but you have to do some verification of various number theoretical and algebraic criteria, and we have no idea if they're true in general or, or when they're true. So we have a couple of general statements. So it is a decidable question. It's reduced completely in the paper. That took quite a lot of work, mostly by Matthias. It's completely reduced to questions of algebra and number theory, but we don't know the answers to those. But in any given case, since they're finite numbers, you can just check everything. So now I want to tell you a little more where this comes from. I should also keep an eye on the time. I've, wait, I started at 4.30, right? So I've, or actually a little beyond, so I've sort of 10 or 15 minutes left. So I mentioned several times the Hertzberg signature theorem as the key thing. Just out of curiosity, how many of you know, I don't mean you could write down with every, uh, dotting all the I's, but how many of you know the Hertzberg signature theorem? Well, some of you certainly do and aren't saying it. Samir, you certainly know it. Sherry, you certainly know it. I think we've got some overly modest people. But I saw several hands don't go, not going up that probably belong to people who were quite correctly not raising their hand because they don't know the Hertzberg signature theorem. It's a wonderful theorem because Hertzberg was my supervisor, so all of his theorems are wonderful. But actually, most of his theorems were wonderful, and this one really is. So if you have an n-manifold, and it's only going to be interesting what I'm going to say if n is divisible by 4, so let's call it 4k, even as I said, my n might be 8k later. If it's a 4k manifold, then we have the middle dimension, but since the middle dimension is even, then you have this pairing, which is now a symmetric pairing. Remember, if the middle dimension was odd, it had to be an anti-symmetric pairing, but non-degenerate, that can only happen, symplectic pairing, if the Betty number was even. Now the Betty number could be anything, but we know that over the real numbers, and even over the rational numbers, not over z, any symmetric quadratic form, I mean, any quadratic form, so symmetric matrix, can be diagonalized, so you can always find a basis over Q such that your manifold, your thing, is diagonal. And then there are various invariants over Q, but if I just work over R, then since every positive number is a square and I can rescale by squares, I can assume that every star is either 1 or minus 1. So the basic uh, thing you have here, R plus signs, and S minus signs, so R plus S is this middle, middle Betty number, and 
R minus S is called the signature. So in the previous lecture on quantum physics, we saw, for instance, signature 1, 3, occurring for a certain quadratic form with 1 minus sign and 3 plus, well, 3, 1 in my notation, 3 plus signs and a minus sign. So the signature theorem gives, as its name said, so we have this invariant, the signature, and you notice that the signature is an integer, and because it's the, the, the sum of the Betty numbers is Bn over 2, and this is the difference, it's certainly at most the middle Betty number, and it's, uh, and it's at least minus the middle bedding number, and it's also congruent to the middle bedding number modulo 2, because r minus s is congruent to r plus s mod 2. So there are, that already pins it down, but there's an exact formula. And the exact formula is extremely beautiful. You take what's called the Hertzbruch L class. That's a cohomology class on the manifold. And then you take its n-dimensional piece, which topologists write as the pairing with the fundamental class, or if you think of, uh, of cohomology classes given by deferential forms, or if you're a physicist, you might think of integrating the corresponding form over the whole manifold. And it's a specific class, and I'll write down its form in a second. So what you do is the manifold, because it's a manifold, it has a tangent bundle, which is a bundle, it's an Rn bundle, over the thing. And this thing, uh, uh, an oriental bundle, has uh, Pontryagin classes. So it has Pontryagin classes, P0 of Tm, which one just writes as P0 of M, is zero dimensional, it's always one. But then you have P1, P2, and so on. And Pi is a four I dimensional class with coefficients in Z and Z. And of course it stops. Uh, well, it, it continues for all i, but of course, if i is bigger than k, then they're, they're zero, because the cohomology group is zero. So you have these classes, and they're given by the theory of characteristic classes. They're computable if you know enough about the manifold. And now, Hitzbrough gives a formula. So these pi's belong to p, and what you do is you take the total Chern class of the manifold, the total Pontryagin class. This is called the Pontryagin classes. There are various spellings depending how you transcribe Pontryagin into English. Uh, P of M, you write as 1 plus P1. Sometimes people put an X there to remind you of the dimension. You don't really have to. I'll drop it. If it helps you, I can put it back in. I don't have to put it. It's a generating series, but since P1 is in dimension 4, P2 in dimension 8, they're separated all by themselves. But if you like, you can put P1X, P2X squared, and so on. Maybe it is helpful. Just remind you that X to the i means that you're in dimension 4i, but the pi tells you. And now you write that formally as a product of some numbers alpha nu, where alpha nu is four-dimensional. But actually, it turns out that the formulas will be easier if I call it alpha nu squared. This is just formally. Now, you can't actually factor this thing in the cohomology, just like you can't factor a polynomial over q into linear factors. But you can pretend you can factor, you can imagine the formal roots and call them even the square roots of, of the formal roots, call them alpha nu squared. Alpha nu, the square roots. So if I do this, then we know from the theory of symmetric polynomials that any polynomial in the alpha nu's, which is even, and therefore a polynomial in the alpha nu squared, and which happens to be symmetric, can also be written as a polynomial in the elementary symmetric polynomials of the alpha nu squared. But those are exactly the pi, because you see p1 is the sum of the alpha nu squared, p2 is the sum nu less than nu prime of alpha nu squared of nu prime squared, etc. These are the elementary symmetric polynomials. And we know from elementary algebra that any polynomial with coefficients in, in z even, which is symmetric in the alpha i nu squared, can be re-expressed as a polynomial of these elementary symmetric things. And that makes sense. So if I do anything symmetric with these alpha nu's, the final answer makes sense, even though the alpha nu don't exist. And now what you do, that's the famous here's proof uh, formula, is you take the product alpha nu divided by hyperbolic tangent of alpha nu. I think it's hyperbolic. Sometimes it's ordinary tangent, depending if I put alpha nu squared or minus alpha nu squared, and I can never remember which sign you have to take to get the correct class. Actually, it doesn't matter for anything I'm doing. It's, I had it written down and it just disappeared. It's, uh, it's hyperbolic tangent, the way I wrote it. 
So let me remind you that alpha over tangent alpha, tangent, hyperbolic tangent of alpha, which is the quotient of Sinch over Koch, is an odd power series. So therefore, alpha over that is an even power series. So it's a power series in alpha squared, and it starts with plus alpha squared over 3 minus alpha to the fourth, plus 2 alpha cubed over 945. Plus, and the denominators of these, these are essentially what Euler found, that was mentioned in the previous lecture, what Euler found in 1834, he found that, for instance, zeta of uh, 6 is pi to the 6th divided by 945. Uh, which is half of this number, and similarly zeta 4 is pi to the 4th over 90, which is half of this number, and so on. So Euler found uh, in 1734, a long time ago, almost 300 years ago, almost, yeah, 300 years ago, that uh, the values of the zeta function are proportional to the coefficients of uh, tension, and these numbers up to a scaling factor are called Bernoulli numbers. I'll write it down in a second. So that's the Hertzberg signature theorem. So you do this very odd procedure, you, you take the Pondriagin classes, which are things you know or can calculate for any given manifold. They're integral classes, but now we work over Q because this thing is full of denominators. We write P formally as the product 1 plus alpha nu squared, and then we take this product. And so if you do this, then you see that this is the product by what I just told you of 1 plus alpha nu squared over 3 minus alpha nu to the fourth over 45. And so if you multiply that out, you see it's 1 plus the sum of the alpha nu squared, but that's P1 over 3. And the next one, I don't remember, but the part is 7P2 minus P1 squared over 45. And the next one is 62 times P3 minus 13 times P1 times P2. So in general, you get all... Per, uh, Partitions of I for the i class. So that's the beginning of the expansion. So the L series is a sum. It's called a piece in dimension in degree 0, 4, 8, 16. And for this, this is simply, uh, this is equal to the 4K dimensional piece, because that's the dimension of this manifold, piece of the L class. So although it looks very abstract and algebraic, at the end of the day, if you have an, a 12 manifold, 12 is 4 times 3, so I have to look at the third L class. I look at this combination of Pontryagin class, evaluate it on the manifold. That's an integer, because there are integer classes. And then by the Hertzberg signature theorem, that integer will be divisible by 945. And if I divide it, the number I get will be the signature of my manifold. OK, so it's kind of an amazing thing. So now I was going to actually give a couple of mini proofs of the number theory part, but the time is uh, running out, so I'll skip it, but the things I say are extremely elementary, I mean, to, to actually prove. And actually, the next thing I say is going to be in, is, is already in Hertzberg's uh, Habilitation, the famous topological methods at the foundations of algebraic geometry, or in algebraic geometry. So let me just tell you briefly, I hope everybody knows at least the existence, that I think I once did give a basic notions talk on, I think, but at least the, no, the word and maybe roughly the definition of the famous Bernoulli numbers. Maybe the most important thing to know about Bernoulli numbers is they were discovered plus or minus a couple of years in 1742, but not by Bernoulli, but actually by Seiki, independently. Seiki Takakazu is a very important Japanese mathematician that even many Japanese mathematicians now have forgotten because somehow when Western mathematics came to Japan at the end of the Edo period, then they purposely, the government kind of decreed that all previous Japanese mathematicians should be forgotten and not taught in the schools because they hadn't helped them to make as good canons as the Americans had. And so they stopped doing Japanese mathematics was, and it's a big pity. And now many young Japanese mathematicians don't even know uh, their own Heroes, Seiki was somebody who discovered many, many things that were discovered sometimes a little earlier, quite often a bit later at the same time in the West. Also his student, Takebi, both were absolutely great mathematicians. For instance, he invented determinants independently of Leibniz at the same time, possibly a year or two earlier, and he invented Bernoulli numbers at the same time, roughly as Bernoulli, for the same reason. Anyway, whoever invented them, here they are. Well, they're, they're all zero for even indices except B1, which is of no interest. So I can put, put down a few, and it starts 1, uh, 1, 6. This is related to the zeta of minus 1 that we saw in, in Atisha's lecture on quantum field theory, 
around. Now, the quantum of physics for mathematicians, then it's minus a third if they alternating sign. Six hundred and ninety-one over. I've forgotten this one is seven sixths. This is a minus sign. It's I, I forget the denominator, but anyway, the denominator is not interesting. It's a product. I think it's three thousand seventy-two or so, it's some stupid number that I've written down right here. But the interesting thing is the numerator. Seiki uh, gave a little table of the Bernoulli numbers when he discovered them, and he stopped before the six ninety-one. He gave them up to the one before he even gave all the zeros. So if you put them all in, in Seiki's works, you, you find even the zeros. But he stopped at, at, at 11. And I think it's not a coincidence. Well, his page was, he was kind of at the end of the page. There wouldn't have been room for another row. But actually, I believe, because he was doing it using Pascal's triangle, but I believe that he calculated B12, found the 691, and since all the others if you divide by k, which is more natural, have no numerator, he assumed he had made a mistake and didn't put it in this book. So he didn't actually tell us the 691, but I don't think it's a coincidence that he stopped just short of the first interesting one. Anyway, these are the famous Bernoulli numbers, and they're definable in many different ways, one of which uh, is at the same time the theorem that uh, anyway I need, which is that alpha over tangent of alpha is the sum uh, well, it's only the even ones because I said the odd ones are zero anyway, except B1, which we're not interested in. Okay, so that's the relation to Bernoulli numbers, and there's also a relation, the log of this thing. Uh, if you take the log of this thing, then the coefficients, there's a very easy formula. There are also multiples of the Bernoulli number, now involving not just a power of two, but also a power of two times a power of two minus one. So it's slightly different. And, and using that, you can easily prove what I'm now going to tell you, which is that if you take L of M, remember in dimension, in every dimension, it's a polynomial in the P's uh, where the total degree is the degree we're looking at, like here, degree 3. It's actually degree 12, because PI is degree 4I. So this is the 12-dimensional piece. So you can ask, what's the linear part? So I can ask, how about when does PK? I mean, every PK will occur, because every partition like the partitions 3, 1 plus 2, and 1 plus 1 plus 1, 3, they all occur with some coefficient. So I can start with the trivial partition, just k gets partitioned as k. So let's call that coefficient sk. It's some rational number. And similarly, another one I'll be interested in that's called the tk is pk squared. But of course, there are many others. There's pk times pl, and there's pk cubed, and so on. But let me just define, uh, write, uh, give notations for those two numbers. Okay, so let me call them SK and TK. TK and the formulas for them, which you get easily from the formula that I didn't show you for the log, so this is an exercise, is SK is 2 to the 2K times 2 to the 2K minus 1 minus 1. I told you there's a power of 2 minus 1 over 2K factorial times B2K, actually the absolute value. But as I told you, the alternating signs, so I could also put minus 1 to the K plus 1. It would be the same. That's SK. And tk, the for, it's a more complicated number, but the formula is simpler. Is it's sk squared minus s2k over 2. So you can write it down short, briefly, but then you have to put in the formulas for the s's. So that's very easy, and the first formula at least is given in Hilsbrook's book, and both are very easy to prove. Oops, I'm not allowed to do that, because there's a microphone in it. It won't work. Okay, so we have these numbers. So now let's look at our 4K manifold, and then I think I'll, I'll more or less stop and not tell you, although it's just when it's beginning to get fun. So we look at the Poincaré series of our manifold. Let M be my rational projective plane. So we already know I told that the dimension has to be, well, 4K, but very quickly it'll be, K will have to be even. That's the theorem already mentioned. So in dimension 2K, the cohomology... Well, it's one-dimensional. That's what I'm assuming. And it's actually it's, uh, ignoring torsion. If I think there is even no torsion in this case. It's just generated by some class X, maybe plus torsion. Then H4K is generated by a multiple of X squared, and it's really X squared. It's not 17 X squared or X squared over 5. That's why Poincaré duality. X paired with itself has to, some multiple of X paired with some multiple has to give the unique generator, and the only way is it's X and X squared. 
Okay? And all the other cohomology is zero. Well, H zero, of course, just generated by one. So therefore, the Pontryagin class is equal to simply one. If k is odd, then the only dimension that's a multiple of four is pk. So it's simply sk times pk. But if k is even, let me call it k is 2l, so n is 8l, then p will be 1 plus sl times pl, which I don't really care about, and then it will be s2l times p2l plus tl times pl squared, because there aren't any other Pontryagin numbers. Uh, sorry, excuse me, I'm, I'm talking nonsense. I'm talking nonsense. I'm talking complete nonsense. P, in the first case, is 1 plus an integer times x, because there isn't any times x squared. There is no other cohomology class. But in the second case, since the middle dimension is, maybe I should call this n, since the middle dimension exists, it is this form where uh, n and n are integers. And now if I work out the Hilsbruch L class, then by what I told you here in the first place, it'll be 1 plus s uh, maybe I'll do it the other way. N is 4L, in the other case, uh, N is 8K. Because I'm more used to the K and I'll make mistakes. So in this case, we have just PK, and by what I just told you, this will be SL times this number N, times X squared. But in the second case, you'll get 1 plus SK times an X, plus, but now I'll have two contributions. First of all, I'll have S2K, times the 2k Pontryagin class, which is n, but I'll also have, I hope I didn't erase it, as a tk times m squared, times x squared. And that's all there is, because there isn't any other cohomology. So the Hertzberg signature theorem will tell me that the signature is equal to, in the first case, sl times some integer, and in the second case, s2k times some integer, plus tk times some integer squared. But what is the signature? Well, it's pretty easy. The middle dimension is one-dimensional. A one-dimensional quadratic form, it's either positive or negative. The signature is plus or minus one. You can even make it one by reversing the orientation. So it's one. So we get this very strong theorem. Well, you can already see that the first one is never going to work because SL, you know, it has to be in a sub-integer multiple of one, and the S and Ks go very rapidly to infinity, and on top of it, they're even. This uh, means that L is one and K is four. That's the thing I already told you. In the case of an odd multiple of four, you only can get dimension four. That follow, just drops out. But in the second case, you get this, and so we have to be able to solve this, and there are no obvious further restrictions on M and N. It turns out there is a further restriction, also coming from Hertzberg's work, but it's something else he did. It was the invention of topological K-theory together with Atiyah. And there's a topological version of, uh, a K-theoretical version of these theorems, and that gives a certain restriction also involving the signature class, but involving class in K-theory, and it involves, instead of the E to the alpha, you take e to the alpha minus 2 plus e to the minus alpha. That's also an even power series in U. And products of this, and you do something, I'm not going to go into it, it gives you a slight extra restriction, and it comes from work of Sullivan and of Hattori and Stone, what the exact restriction is. But let's just stick to this main one, which comes straight from the signature theorem. And let me now just tell you in a couple of words what this leads to. Well, the first point is this. The Bernoulli number is always an odd number divided by two times an odd number. Actually, there's a complete formula, very famous, the von Stahl-Clausen formula, for the entire denominator of pk. It's a product of certain primes to the, of bk over k even. Or, no, bk, it's a product of certain primes. Uh, but, he, but for the prime two, it just occurs once. So here, the power of two, this is a one two in the denominator. This is no twos at all. Here, the number of twos is a famous form. Here, the number of twos is 2k. And here the number of twos is a famous formula, which is roughly 2k, or it's exactly 2k, minus the number of ones in the binary expansion of k. So here I have one two too many, but here I have one fewer. So I have a two, but this is two in the denominator. So this thing is odd if and only if k has only one power in its binary expansion, which means it's a power of two. And it's two mod four if and only if k is a power, a sum of two different powers of two, and otherwise it's zero mod four. So in other words, just very trivially, these sks are always divisible by, uh, by two, except if k is a power of 
2. And so now, if you look at this, then you see that to make this 1, that both numbers can't be odd. I mean, if S2K and TK, they can't both be even, then I'll never get 1. SK is essentially always even, but SK squared is divisible by 4, so when you divide by 2, it's still even. But S2K may be just barely even. I think I'm off by 1. So what you find is that this implies too adequately already that K is a power of 2 or a sum of 2 powers of 2, which actually includes this case if you allow them to be the same power of 2. So that's an extremely strong restriction. There are only uh, about 120 numbers up to a million that are sums of at most 2 powers of 2. So already, my list that I reduced from a million to 19, I've already reduced from a million cases to about 120. And that's, you know, my computer only had to look at those 120 and is now eliminated five sixths of them roughly. So that's very easy. And by the way, this you can give a complete theorem that I should say there exists a manifold with Betty numbers one, all zeros until the middle dimension, n over two, uh, zero, zero. And now I don't say what it is, I just put odd. Then the same argument will tell me I have to work a little well, I have to work harder, but if I get, got it right, this is true now, if and only if n is maybe 4k, uh, and k is the sum of two powers, at most two powers of two, roughly. So if you don't ask to have a rational projective plane with the one in the middle, but just anything odd, uh, and by the way, then you can also take care of the zeros. You, just having an odd number at all in the middle, that will happen. If I, now I'm not sure enough I'm getting it right, only if it's a sum of two powers of two. So there are other cases than the rational projective planes. So this is the first condition. But now there are two more conditions, because there are two other things that could go wrong for a prime. So the conditions on K, and that's what makes it so restrictive. And then I'll stop. The conditions on K, remember N is 8K, and I'm assuming there is a rational projective plane. So the first one I already told you that's already extremely restrictive, which is that k or n is a product of only two powers of two, or, or one power of two. The second one is not restrictive at all, so far as I know. It says that b2k and b4k, or their numerators, are co-prime. Because if some prime number, some large odd prime, divided b2k, it would be an sk. So it would be here. If it also divided b4k, it would be an s2k. And so we divide both of these. And therefore, P would divide both S2K and TK. And then that's impossible, because then every linear combination would be a multiple of P. That can, so as I said, this is extremely restrictive. 10 to the sixth goes down to about 120 or 150. This is not restrictive at all. If I just looked at the 120, they don't, it wasn't exactly 120, they don't change. It never happens that these numbers are already a very thin set. But even if I look at all numbers, I've gone up to about 500,000, it took days on the computer. I've never found a case where Bernoulli number and the Bernoulli number with twice the index had any factor in common. Never found one. However, I conjecture that there are infinitely many. And there's an easy reason which I won't tell unless anyone asks. So question, can you find any pair of Bernoulli numbers, well, it has to have even index, so 2K and 4K, which are both divisible by the same prime? Does that ever happen? It does not happen up to, you know, several hundred thousand. But I, I'm sure that it happens infinitely often, but extremely rarely. But so rarely that it's intersected with this other very thin set of sums of two powers of two is undoubtedly zero. So I'm absolutely convinced that there will be never a case where you pass test one and you need test two, but still I have to add it to the list because we don't know. But there's one other thing which is slightly, it's a little hidden, but you actually can see it. Is somebody in the room really good with number theory and can just see immediately? What? There's one last condition. In order to be able to solve this equation, so I've already said, we have to be able to solve, since the signature is 1, I have to be able, I think I already wrote it, I have to be able to solve the equation tkm squared plus s2kn equals 1. tk and s2k, I told you what they were, and m and n are just some integers that we don't know anything about. What is the condition? Well, this is a piadic condition. This is just a congruence, because since we don't know anything about n, it just says that tk times the square is congruent to 1 modulo s2k, 
right? It, it has nothing to do with these numbers. It's just a multiple. So it's a congruence condition. It's true about the Chinese remainder theorem, if and only if it's true for every prime that divides S2K. If P doesn't divide the numerator of S2K, even worse, if P is in the denominator, there's no restriction at all. Well, one case is what if a prime divided both S2K and T2K? Then it couldn't work. Well, that prime would either be 2, that's how I got the condition on the powers of 2, or it could be an odd prime, that's where I got the coprimality. But there's one other thing. This TK is not a random number. It is equal to SK squared minus S2K over 2. But since I've already taken care of the two-adic stuff, to ask this piadically, I can multiply by 2. I haven't lost anything. And so I want this modular 2 S2K, but now we see that T2K times 2 is minus a square. Except I want plus a square. No, it's plus a square. Modular S2K, TK times 2 is SK squared. So what I get is that there's a square which is 2, modular S2K. That is not possible for every number, because this is possible for a given number S, that 2 is a square modular that number, again by the Chinese remainder theorem, if and only if, for all p dividing my number, you can have a square which is congruent to 2 mod p. But that's by Gauss, is the same as saying that p is congruent to 1 or to 7 modulo 8. And therefore, we have the last criterion, which is that all p dividing s to k are congruent to plus or minus 1 mod p. So now let me go back to the theorem with that long list, which I think I've erased. And let me just show you, I'll wave in the air, my handwritten table of factorizations. And the top factorization, maybe you can see them there, there are three lines of very long numbers that I copied by hand, 50-digit numbers. That's the factorization of the Bernoulli number that I need for 32. Remember, that was one of the dimensions, the last dimension, it's 8 times 32, 256. That number is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 primes. The last one is 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 9, 1, 6, 1, 6, 7, 9, 8. I've read about a tenth of it. It's an 80-digit prime. But still, it might be 1 or 7 mod 8. The chance are 50-50. Since this number has 6 primes, the chance was 1 in 64 that it would pass all 6 tests. But a small miracle happened, 1 chance in 64. That particular number, so the B uh, 4 times 32, I think it was, the numerator is a product of 6 primes, but they're all congruent just by chance to plus or minus 1 mod 8. So there's no problem, and since that's the only necessary condition, it works. Now when you get to 68, it doesn't sound rather harmless, but it's B4 times 68. It's a 300-digit number. It is one small prime, but it's, it, it's not a useful one. It works. And then there's this huge number, and the computer worked for weeks and weeks and weeks. And it's using an algorithm based on the theory of elliptic curves that can almost guarantee that any prime small prime factors, meaning up to 10 to the 25, would have been found. But unfortunately, this number is 300 digits, and so if it's a product of two primes, they might have 150 digits. If a product of three, it might be 100 digits. If a product of four, they might be 80 digits. So they're much bigger, and we haven't found any of them. So if it is three primes, well, the number itself is one mod eight, or I wouldn't be testing it. So if there are three primes, there's one chance in four that it works. If there are seven primes, which is more likely, then there's one chance in 100. If there are 20 primes, that's impossible, because then it would have to have some small prime factors that we've already checked. So that number has a few primes. We don't know how many, probably somewhere between three and maybe even two. But even if it is only two, the chance is only 50-50 that it'll work. But the next number in my list already is a 1,000-digit number. That's going to have dozens of primes, and the chance that they all work is essentially zero. That's why I said that almost certainly we'll never have success again. So I'm finished, but I showed you that this topological problem led to three necessary conditions, one of which is very restricted but very easy, sum of two powers of two. One is amusing and probably not restrictive at all, but leads to a non-trivial problem that I don't know if it's ever been studied. Can two Bernoulli numbers whose indices differ by a factor of two have a common factor? And the third leads to this weird problem of factorization of Bernoulli numbers that is almost certainly unsolvable and to the classification up to dimension a million. So thank you.